tonight. We have Compass to MS Care program, all right? This is Compass to MS Care reaching rural America. For those that do not know, my name is Stuart Schlossman, president and founder of MS Views and News. And of course, as most know, I too am an MS patient. And for tonight, you could see we have quite a few sponsors for our Compass to Care series. This is our virtual sponsors. We have Genentech, Novartis, EMD Serono, Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, and Bristol Myers Squibb. And so I thank them and I hope you all do too. All right, tonight we have Dr. Al Jolson Walker and Dr. Al Jolson Walker is a neuro-ophthalmologist. Um, he's been practicing for 32 years. He's at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. And he's been you know, taking care of MS patients for quite a few years now. He will be speaking about MS 101, looking at MS over the years and what we know today, access to MS care, as well as managing the needs of those um, and learning how to use telehealth. I'll speak about that briefly, understanding new and future DMTs, and well, I don't know what else he's got in his slideshow, but he'll speak to you about that, all right? So he's gonna be speaking for like 35 to 40 minutes, at which time at the end of that, I'm gonna come back online we're going to say thank you to the doctor. Then we're going to start Q&A. All right. So let's allow the doctor to get started. Come on, Dr. Walker. Yes, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for the welcome, Stuart. Appreciate it. Ladies thank and you. gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to join these programs. And of course, for those of you who are living with multiple sclerosis or with family members or have close relatives or friends with this disorder, you are aware of its sort of unknown presentation, sometimes the surprise that it brings forth as well. Tonight's presentation sort of illuminates a number of sort of uh, remote issues in the distant past and brings some things forward as well. We discussed to some degree some of the medications as well, but the key thing is to, to get the diagnosis and then get that as quick as possible, even though that's not always uh, possible to do. What you see here, we're going to re review the state of the disease itself. We're going to review some of the diagnostic criteria, the symptoms, what is a relapse. We also discuss to some degree the COVID-19 in terms of how it affects potentially the MS patient. And then we discuss some of the current medications. But in order to do that, of course, you have to discuss medications of the past as well. Next, please. I've done some consultant work for Banner. Next, please. Ladies and gentlemen, often we are asked the question, what is MS? What does it look like? Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is an old picture. Granted, there are other pictures that are fancier to some degree, but when you ask a MS doctor or health care professional about what is MS, this is what he or she is thinking about. This, this diagram, you see all this stuff on here, you see all these different molecules, and the point being is that this is how the immune system, or at least what is thought to be, how the immune system is affected by whatever causes this disorder. And once again, I say whatever causes it, we don't know what causes this disorder, and that's part of the issue, so therefore when one asks the question, when is the cure coming? Well, once we know what causes it, to be honest with you, we're probably then particularly close to then the so-called cure. Next, please. When a person presents to the healthcare provider, in this case, the question being, do I or do I not have MS? What you see here is a list of multiple other disorders. And these are the things that can mimic multiple sclerosis in terms of its presentation, whether it be the fatigue component, the weakness on one side of the body, the numbness component, the cognitive aspects of it, the vision loss or vision change components of it as well. And so as a result of that reality, these things are often looked at. Usually laboratory data can help the doctor or healthcare provider. Sometimes the imaging studies done by MRI can help eliminate some of them. And some of them require the spinal tap as a part of that evaluation to eliminate that as a possibility when it comes to things on this list that you see before you. Once again, the point being is that because there's no actual precise test that says, while I get this blood test or just genetic test, while I you have MS, we don't have that yet. That is a hope that has been looked for, that has been sought after by many. And once we have that, then this list will be eliminated or at least reduced substantially. 
Next slide, please. The original sort of description of a patient with multiple sclerosis occurred probably in the 1860s. And that was a fellow by the name of Charcot who described a teenager at that time that later on after they passed away, they did autopsy and they found changes that looked like scars termed plaques. And that's where the plaque term comes from, or at least originates from. And then formally in 1965, a physician by the name of Shoemaker began to actually describe and formalize what we now know as multiple sclerosis. And of course, in this era, in this timeline, they didn't have MRIs then. And they had, they actually, in fact, didn't have even CT scans, even though now in modern day, we know that CT scans do not do a adequate job of identifying MS progression or a disease state. MRIs do, but CAT scans don't. But the key point to this slide being here is that if he used clinical symptoms only, meaning that if you presented with the right history and ideally the exam agreed with those findings, you had multiple sclerosis as a diagnosis. Then came Poser in 1983. And what he did, he attempted to uh, objectify it even further, meaning that identify other sort of studies or tests that might give more hard evidence, if you will. And so what he did was he actually added something called a visual irrevocable response, the brainstem auditory response. And these are sort of subtle tests that test some of the accessory sensory modalities in an individual. Still, some of this is still done today, as a matter of fact. And he also introduced the idea of the spinal tap back then looking for myelin basic proteins, which um, now we don't really do as much because we now have found out that that is not as specific as we want it to be. So then came the McDonald criteria. And McDonald had updates, the first one being in 2001 in terms of the actual criteria, then 05 update, 2010 update, and so forth. And what he did primarily was to add in the significance of the MRI, meaning that by this point, we already had MRI studies, but changes in the MRI itself does not necessarily designate an individual as having multiple sclerosis. What it did was it sort of solidified the idea. You still would do examination pieces. You still would do potential spinal tap as well. And the combination of the data would be fully supportive. And what the MRI did, it changed things, for example, like if an individual presented by history and they're very competent that they've only had one symptom, loss of vision in one eye, as an example, nothing more. Pain on eye movement was classic optic neuritis. You do the MRI. The MRI shows not only that that vision nerve enhances, but it also demonstrates another lesion someplace else. Ah, now this individual may very well be diagnosed with having multiple sclerosis because now the MRI identifies another lesion different than the one being presented, suggesting two separate events in space and time, and now you meet criteria for multiple sclerosis. Once again, the MRI with these updates became that significant when it wasn't the case earlier on. It was something that said, well, these changes are there, these changes clearly look demolating. These changes are probably most often consistent with MS. What does the clinic exam look like itself? If the two, three items look similar, gelled, if you will, then the diagnosis was made. Once again, just to give you an idea of the criteria and how they sort of uh, changed over time. Next slide, please. This slide is just to give you guys what you already know, that it's, it's of greater uh, presentational incidence in women when it comes to men. Uh, there's an age range that's presented here as well, suggesting that women tend to present younger than males with this disorder. And there are also ethnic differences in terms of how people present, where they are Hispanic or whether they're African-American and so forth. There's, so there's other changes that you see uh, in terms of being a little older, some of them a little younger as well. And then how they present, what symptoms they statistically present with has also changed over time. And now this one data item here, it, it says that 450,000 in the United States, that's actually been upped to about a million at this time. 
even though that's probably an under representation, it's probably even more than that, but that's the most recent update that I've been aware of at this point in time. Next slide, please. This slide is just to remind me of some of the other realities in that there are groups of individuals, small, granted, extremely small, that seem to have a genetic predisposition for what we now uh, call multiple sclerosis. The majority of people that's not true. In fact, I will tell you that for most of you, you are likely the only individual in your family with this disorder. And that's more often than not the case. Occasionally, granted, you'll see a father, daughter, a father, son, mother, son, mother, daughter, um, brother, sister. Occasionally, you will see that. And that definitely does happen. Uh, but in general, usually it's an isolated single individual with the disorder itself. Next slide, please. Once again, this slide just gives you an idea of what some of the markers are. And because they are not consistent enough genetic testing at this point is still not done readily because the data you get is not enough to help to confirm or even suggest a pattern of inheritance for your children or anyone else. Next slide, please. Same idea here as well. Next slide, please. And once again, here just sort of gives you uh, what has been found, uh, identified in, in particular groups Sometimes, not enough that you can use it, but once again, of interest. Next slide, please. Okay. I mentioned to you guys earlier the term plaques, and it, and it was actually coined many eons ago. And basically, it sort of reports the idea of a scar um, as what has happened to these individuals. And white matter is sort of the term used. And let me sort of back up just a little bit. When it comes to the brain, and most of you are familiar with the idea of white matter and gray matter. And so let me sort of change that a little bit and say, let's say that the white matter are the streets or the roads that lead to a location. And the gray matter is in fact the location. And so basically the point being is that the white matter is the wires that send information from point A to point B. That's what that, what that is. And there is a particular cell type in the brain that produces an insulation for these, in fact, nerves. It's sort of like you got unpaved roads and now you got paved roads. The paved roads are myelinated, the unpaved roads are not. It's the same sort of idea. And as you might imagine, if somehow or another you're on a paved surface, that paved road, the, the myelin, and then all of a sudden, the paved surface goes away. Now it gets bumpy, rough, dusty, among other things. But your travel is now probably to some degree impeded to some degree. Well, imagine if you will that, the, that these wires have this myelin. The myelin what gives it its white color, if you wondered. And if that's removed or that goes away, then you have a situation where information going from point A to point B is delayed. Or if it's a big enough of a roadblock, if you will, or uh, damage, then there's a full interruption. Meaning that now if those wires moved your right arm, if it was just a slight delay, you'll see a weakness in that arm. It will move a little slow, but it still moves. If it's a complete blockage, then the arm won't move at all. Once again, just, once again, trying to give you an idea of the significance of that myelin and what it does. It basically insulates those nerves and causes information to be transmitted in a very timely, rapid manner. And without it, it doesn't happen nearly as well. And then the gray matter is the goal. They get to that location and they make a difference. And so what I want to say here is that one of these sort of questions asked by me for Mr. St for Stewart was that what's the change? What's the update? Well, MS was thought originally to only be a white matter disorder originally. Over the last number of years, last decade or two, if you will, I mean actually probably yeah, decade or two, maybe three, as a matter of fact, there was a realization that multiple sclerosis actually affects the gray matter. Now, not that that's a new idea because they've known that it affected gray matter always. However, it was thought to be a late effect 
of multiple sclerosis, not an early effect. And now we know that early on in the disease process, individuals will have issues with their gray matter. How might that present? That might present with word finding difficulty, memory concern, memory issues, uh, focus, attention span. I mean, once again, things that are more global may be those symptoms, or it may be that the person now has worsening gait, worsening walk, poor or balanced. Those can also be an aspect of that problem as well. And I bring it to your attention for a particular reason, but I'm not going to tell you that just yet. Next slide, please. And once again, in this slide, this sort of illuminates what we've simply just discussed and what is it's sort of adding the idea that the T cells are playing a role uh, with this, meaning that that's your, and that's the role of your immune system, meaning that for the MS patient, you have a circumstance to which your immune system suspects that your cells that make insulation or the insulation that's being made is infected as a foreign material and its job is to remove anything that does not belong and so it actively tries to do that and you would call that an MS exacerbation or MS attack or MS event whichever term you may want to use and the location of that event dictates the level of compromise that you may or may not feel. Once again, very interesting to say the least. Next slide, please. The full mechanisms, mainly descriptions, meaning that an in, in, in individual's passing at autopsy, they can see early effects, late effects, and once again, try to describe that. With the goal mean, being that if we can see the end result, maybe we can reverse engineer, if you will, and then identify earlier on what may in fact be happening, learn from that, maybe even develop medications that might intercede in some way. And once again, this, to some degree, that's somewhat been done, if you will. Next slide, please. Brain atrophy. I mentioned to this, this to you earlier how there's the gray matter, there's the white matter. What's the big deal with the gray matter? Let me explain that to you. I mentioned earlier that an individual can have the white matter injuries or plaques. You can sometimes see an individual who is on their disease modifying therapy. They have historically been doing well, but as time progresses, they're getting a little worse. They're progressing things are still sort of moving forward, yet they are on proper therapy. What might be happening to the individual? Well, if you're only looking at white matter, you may see no change at all. However, if you begin to look at the gray matter, you may notice areas or regions that are shrinking, that are atrophying, getting smaller in size. As I mentioned to you guys earlier, we've now become aware of the fact that a person can progress, show symptoms merely by it of being an effect of the gray matter as well early on in the disease state. So they're working on models that will then begin to measure gray matter accurately. So then when you call your healthcare provider and ask them, Doc, I'm getting worse. I saw the MRI, it said that the white matter did no changes, but what it also did say is that I have a 2%, 4%, 8%, 12% increase in atrophy on so-and-so location. Doc, what is that area equal? And if it's in the right frontal lobes, it may be, wow, intellectual uh, is an effect for that individual. Or if it's in the very back, it may in fact be an issue with their sight. So once again, the point being is that this is being looked at, trying to be, get it quantitated and then able to be used across multiple platforms. And once that's done, then we probably have another measuring tool to monitor this disease state. Next slide, please. 
And this slide, once again, illuminates what many of you are already aware of, the, the MS symptoms, uh, the vision, the fatigue. And I will tell you that for this entire list, probably the, the most devastating item on this list is probably the fatigue for many of the MS patients. And it's also the thing that's least treatable in, in a lot of ways, even though the most recent hard data, hard research suggests that exercise is probably the best one item that works, but once again, not everybody is able to actually exercise. So therefore, we, as you know, we tend to use stimulus instead. Next slide, please. And this slide, once again, attempts to give uh, numbers in terms of what, how patients present. And weakness is up there with sensory changes. Sensory changes means numbness, tingling, sometimes pain for some of you. Arthritis is a common presenting symptom because what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. An individual will ignore weakness as long as they're not falling, they're not injuring themselves. They tend to ignore it sometimes. They will ignore numbness if they're still able to participate in their, all their activities or at least some of their activities of daily living. Patients don't ignore I can't see, particularly if they have the classic uh, component of pain on our movement. Because Americans don't do pain. We don't like pain. I mean, that's one of those things that we tend not to ignore. So we tend to see the healthcare prof care professional, particularly if now I can see and the eye hurts. That's not working for me. And so as a result, that tends to be looked at. And so depending on the study, you actually may see a large number of patients presenting with that disorder. And not that it's the most frequent disorder, it's just that it's the most common presenting problem because people don't tend to ignore it. So once again, this slide just brings that, eliminates that reality. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, what I have here, ladies and gentlemen, for I think the next four or five slides, they're all sort of the same thing. The, te the content is different, but the point being here is some of the criteria, if you will, that your healthcare uh, provider is using to actually make that diagnosis based on what you give them as a history and then what they identify radiographically and what they may or may not find out per spot tap if they've done one. And then of course, as I mentioned to you guys earlier, the older original stuff that was done by Poser using the brainstem auditory vote potentials or the visual event potentials and so forth. Once again, all tools trying to make sure that a diagnosis is made. What's the big deal? Here's the big deal, ladies and gentlemen. Originally, back in Shoemaker's day, when there were no FDA-approved medications for multiple sclerosis, physicians did a number of things. Put them get patients on chemotherapy. Some of them did nothing because they weren't sure what to do. But it was sort of hit or miss what people did. Once we had the first FDA-approved medication, those medications had their own risk. For the most part, the risks weren't fatal necessarily unless there was an allergic reaction to the medication. The biggest issue was they may or may not have been ineffective. Well, what has happened over time is now we have medications that were some of which were our former chemotherapies, some of which are aggressive agents otherwise that suppress their immune system to such a substantial degree that individuals are predisposed to this thing called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. You know that is PML. And we know that PML in of itself is a fatal disorder. So if a person gets the diagnosis and it turns out that they get this PML, it becomes very problematic. Not that one wants to have that to happen, certainly, but this is why physicians often are more cautious, I think, in modern day, because we know that you can get uh, medications that become problematic if things aren't quite right. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. And next slide. And next slide. Okay. Now, natural history of MS. What is this? This is an old slide, guys. So there, there are more, some more modern ones, but this particular one happens to be my favorite, so I, I always often use it. So this slide, what it attempts to give us is, is this idea. What you see 
in the sort of uh, gold or yellow arrows sticking up. Those represent uh, sort of MS events that have happened. And what you see up top is a re re reported relapse. What you notice is that you see a lot more of those events than you see relapse. Relapse is when a patient presents to the physician or healthcare provider and says that I've had a new event. So often patients will say, Dr. Walker, is it okay if we go off to disease modifying therapy and simply watch and wait, do intermittent MRIs as opposed to putting me on medication? Well, here's the thing. We could do that, but unless the event or le or or uh, what's a better word for it relapse, but more importantly, lesion occurs at a cognizant location. You don't know that it happened. It's going to get missed. And what we do know in modern day is that for every lesion that you don't get, we reduce the likelihood for a disability for you. That's the goal. And so in as much as going, not being on a disease modifying therapy, you may feel great, you may look great, but bad things could be happening underneath all of that greatness, if you will. And so as a result, we tend to push, if you will, being on a disease modifying therapy for those reasons. And I would admit to you, back in the day, before we knew this, we would have a patient, they have minimal to no actual clinical symptoms, we're comfortable that they do in fact have MS, we have evidence for that, to do the MRI, the MRI shows maybe one lesion, maybe two, and the patient really wants to opt not to do a medication because the original medications were injectable and a lot of patients have issues with needles and injection and medicine sometimes had their own native side effects. As a result, the patient said, well, doc, you know, can we just wait and see? And we had no evidence to suggest that was a bad move, so that's what we did. But what we now have found out, as mentioned here, is that probably is not the best option. And granted, I have patients to this day who are not taking a disease-modifying therapy, but they're fully informed of what the potential outcome could be if you do that. Next slide, please. And once again, this slide is just put up here for purposes of just introducing the idea that the majority of patients have remitting relapsing multiple sclerosis, which is to 85%, meaning that they have an attack, they have a, a recovery of 85 to 95%, they have an attack, they have a recovery of 85 to 90%. And, and then that's what it's really saying. And then eventually, our individual will move towards sometimes what's called secondary progressive, in which case then they have an event, but the recovery is very small, sometimes not noticeable by the patient, and they just get a little worse, a little worse, a little worse. And that's often termed secondary progressive. Those patients radiographically, you tend to notice not much in the way of white matter changes, but if you were to measure their brain mass, you may see that substantially being reduced. Now there is, this, this idea of something called active secondary progressive. Um, and these are individuals that happen to get a new lesion that may in fact enhance, in which case then that individual has a medication treatment that worked for them. And then of course you see the others, primary progressive, secondary progressive as well. Next slide, please. And then this is, says that when you have the MS exacerbation, how much time it takes for you to reach that maximum deficit, if you will, which is three to five days at most. And then the recovery is usually the most robust in the first 30 days, but you have usually 90 to 120 days to show full recovery if you're going to. Next slide, please. And then this slide, so it, once again, is a scale system. There is a doctor by the name of Kursky that developed, well, how can we do research? How can we determine what a patient has? How can we determine the, the level of disability uh, in, in California versus South Carolina versus Georgia versus Wisconsin and so forth? Well, 
created a scale system that is still to this day used. And as you see there, the numbers as well as what that equals. And once again, for a lot of you, this has been done when you'll see the doctor in clinic. Next slide, please. And of course, MRIs with contrast, the contrast is necessary to show the enhanced lesions. Next slide, please. And in this slide, once again, when you're reading and reviewing your MRIs, you see these terms T2, T1, and so forth. Black holes are sometimes used um, as well. And this is what uses the descriptors that the doctor will read through, and then he or she would explain to you what those mean, and he didn't show you a picture of it in general. Next slide, please. And this is just a photograph that we, we, we acquired, and this gives you guys an idea of what MS is can look like. For most of you, I suspect you've seen your MRI, so you know, you know what this lease looks like for you. And there's very large white areas here are where a person has white matter injury, if you will. And then D is where an individual has what is termed the black hole. These are regions where there's complete brain atrophy and there's no uh, sort of active tissue in that location, all it represents. Next slide, please. And then, of course, for those of you that have had the spinal tap done, you may see this fancy word oligoclonal bands printed there. And what that is, if an individual has injury to their insulation on their nerves, we term that the myelin. One of the byproducts of that injury is, in fact, oligoclonal bands. Each laboratory, each location, each facility has its own standard for when it's abnormal and when it's normal. For example, at the Medical University of South Carolina, any value above one is considered positive, meaning this person has a number or presence of these autonomous bands that is relevant to suggesting that they have dem um, demyelinating disorder. Doesn't necessarily mean they have MS, but it certainly agree with the idea that they may in fact have MS. Well, on the other hand, there are some locations in the upper part of this state where any number above three is considered positive. So my point to you is that be sure to look at the details if you are reviewing this kind of information and you want to make sure that the result you have in fact is positive, suggest something versus not. And then of course, the immunoglobin index is just another sort of marker. Often this is elevated, at least just under 80% of the time is elevated. In some studies, closer to 90% of the time is elevated as well when a person has the presence of these autoclonal bands. Once again, trying to collect as much data as possible to lead to a very practical, reasonable, concrete diagnosis for a given patient. Next slide, please. As I mentioned to you guys earlier, these uh, studies that were proposed by the doctor name is Poser. This just lists those for you. The visual evoke response and, and the somatosensory evoke potential and the brainstem auto evoke potential. These are all those studies which are somewhat still done, particularly the VER more so than any of these. The brainstem and the somatosensory, not every location now has the equipment to actually do those. Next slide, please. And here we are. I'm sure there's some of you that wondered, what does JC stand for in virus? Well, John, JC stands for John Cunningham. John Cunningham was one of the initial individuals to describe this particular virus. And so they use his initials, JC virus, stand for John Cunningham. Next slide, please. As I mentioned to you guys earlier, when you're looking at the MS medications, we know those as disease modifying therapies, what you sometimes are bothered by is this idea of, my goodness, this, this virus, where did I get it? Well, the series of slides that we have now sort of give you an idea of the location of these of these uh, the virus in particular. And these are sort of seem to occur casually, but interesting enough is that only 60% of the general population has this virus on present at all times. Most of the time, you never have a symptom related to it. When is the symptom related to it? Typically that occurs when you are dramatically 
immunosuppressed, meaning that conditions known as HIV, you're immunosuppressed dramatically. Sometimes in the course of getting chemotherapy for a cancer or, so, or related treatment, that can cause this virus to, to erupt. Well, some of the MS medications suppress the immune system in such a manner, sometimes to a certain degree, that this virus, which is latent, which is already there, erupts. And unfortunately, if it erupts and it involves your central nervous system, your brain, it can then be fatal uh, in terms of the outcome. And there is no defined treatment exactly for this. There, there are multiple different techniques that people have tried that in some degree interrupts its spread per se, but you still may be left with significant brain injury if that occurs. And so the point being is that the, it's a virus that's typically there in 60% of the population, while another 40% doesn't seem to have it present. Next slide, please. All right, next slide. Next slide. And next slide. And the uh, next slide. Okay. So what you see here in this photograph to the right in the top and top left and then middle left is what an MRI might show for an individual patient that presented with what was suspected to be progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. The patient would present with a significant change in personality, significant loss uh, in body movement, um, but typically is a dramatic impactful change. And then radiographically, MRI-wise, you would see the significant aspect or component of the brain uh, affected. And that individual may present with seizures and never had seizures before. Once again, the point being is that it's a progressive, abrupt change um, that often tips this off. And of course, if they do a spinal tap, they will see a large JC virus um, amount, if you will, uh, present as well. And then they do go through a sort of series of different techniques to, re to reduce the inflammatory response and the infected response as well. Once again, these individuals are often left with significant brain injury and then a number of them would pass away as a result of. Next slide, please. And next slide. And this slide just talks about some of the treatments that are done. And of course, you might imagine the person gets an antiviral. They get uh, uh, other treatments, if you will. Once again, trying to reduce the impact if the person's on, for example, one of the medications, if that medication can be removed from their body, for example, uh, natalizumab, otherwise known as Tysabri, they actually can remove it uh, using a process called hemophoresis. And after five hemophoresis treatments, that medication would be removed from the body completely. Um, if it is thought to be uh, assisting in the particular circumstance, that can be done. And then antivirals and other therapies are then done as well. And each facility sort of has its own protocol and how to approach its treatment. Next slide, please. And what we're down to now is I've listed some of the medications. They're not all here. And, and the list here just demonstrates uh, some of the names that some of you are very, very familiar with, uh, the glutyrima acetate, uh, as well as the Avonex and Rebif, and once again, the list of the medications. And these original medications, as you know, all were injectable, uh, or in the, in the case of Tysabri, infusible once every 28 days, even though some of you have moved to a five-week protocol, some of you have moved to a six-week protocol as well. And then, of course, the, the last medication on this particular slide, Novantron, most of you have never heard of or ever used, but some of you have, um, in that uh, it was used for the purposes of treating individuals with rapidly advancing MS. And it was quite effective in stopping that rapid advancement. However, the medication has a dramatic effect on the heart. As such, it causes significant heart injury. So any individual, any person who's ever been on this medication uh, has to get a heart echocardiogram essentially every year for the rest of their life. 
because it can cause a cardiomyopathy to the point that one can develop heart failure. So once again, that's why it's essentially not used any longer in this point in time. Next slide, please. And then this slide just once again lists some of the other medications that are out there um, as well. It doesn't list them all, and I apologize that they are not all there. But once again, some of the newer medicines are listed here and, and their milligram in size. And once again, a lot of treatments is a matter of you and the healthcare provider attempting to sort of customize treatment considerations. If you are a traveler or business person, you may want something that's given less frequently. On the other hand, at the time of your presentation or during the course of your disease state, it's found that you have an aggressive disorder, at least a version of MS that you have, that doctor or health provider might want to go with a medication perceived to be more aggressive and directly treat you in that way as well. Once again, because we have just over 20 different medications to choose from, it allows for the health provider and the patient to customize their treatment to that particular person's sort of interests and needs as well. Next slide, please. And of course, there are people that, in fact, in the era uh, before we had the first FDA-approved medication for multiple sclerosis, it was not uncommon that a person was being managed by using high-dose steroids as their primary treatment. And there's still docs to this day who use that as part of their protocols. Um, and that's, that's been done uh, in and of itself. Long-term use can sometimes have complications with uh, bone mineralization, as well as weight issues, as well as uh, uh, other hormonal issues, not mentioning uh, other complications like cataracts and, and glaucoma and other sort of areas that can be worsened uh, with this use, not to mention uh, the weight gain aspects of it um, as well. However, it, it uh, tends to do a good job of reducing sometimes the initial impact of an MS exacerbation. However, keep in mind that as far as we know it thus far, it tends to primarily hasten the recovery of a patient. It doesn't necessarily stop what's going to happen, okay? but it does tend to hasten one's recovery. So whatever degree that you are going to recover, it tends to speed that up as a general rule. And then of course you see listed here also other medications as well that sometimes can be used and be helpful, particularly if you have adverse reactions or so-called allergic to the steroid, then patients are often given this ACTAR gel, which is ACTH, which again, uh, was one of the original treatments for MS before they actually ever had the first FDA-approved medication. Then, of course, there's the walking medication. Next slide, please. And then there's the individuals that present with a single event. Radiographically, they have seemingly the single event. It is comfortable that it's the myelinating origin. It is the early, early presentation uh, probably of multiple sclerosis. They likely will have another event. Um, and there are medications that are FDA approved actually to treat the clinical isolated syndrome. And it's these names that you're familiar with, medicines like uh, uh, Avonex, medications like Rebev, and, and then many others that are FDA approved to treat CIS. So even though it's not formally multiple sclerosis, but it's treated similarly, if you will. Next slide, please. And then, but this slide just once again illuminates who's at high risk for a relapse, if you will, and then who's not. And then, of course, this is an older component in the bottom, which means it's Avonex, Beta Saron, Extavia, and Copaxone that are FDA approved, but there are actually other medications FDA approved. Uh, for SCIS at this point in time as well. Next slide, please. And then there's vitamin D. And so there was data that dates back almost 15 to 20 years now that uh, suggested that people who had low vitamin D may in fact have increased risk of developing MS, also increased risk of having MS exacerbations. That data has not held up as strongly or as well as we had hoped 
and modern day, but it's still there. And particularly when you consider that if your vitamin D level is low, it's not unreasonable to normalize that. So this slide just gives you an idea of some of the treatments and the amounts that are sometimes given. Next slide, please. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, as you well are aware of, we don't know what causes multiple sclerosis. We just know that it strikes certain groups more than others. We know that it tends to create certain symptoms more so than others. We know that there can be a conduit effect, vision effect, mode of movement effect from this. It can equal a total disability where you're bedridden. It can equal where you have had symptoms, but you have no resolution, of no symptoms at all. Later on, there are people who walk around who, unless they tell you they have multiple sclerosis, you have no idea they have it. Then there are those that are more dramatically affected by it with the wheelchair, with the walker, with the Pain as well. And so as we continue to learn to move to evolve, we get into that place where we have a better sense of this disorder. So hopefully as time progresses and research progresses as well, as you guys participate in the research studies, we will learn more and we will get to that big thing called the cure. And then from there, I'm jobless, but I'm okay with that. Thank you. All right, so I'm back with you. How are you all? Thank you very much, doctor. That was very good. I'm glad that you were on tonight. It definitely um, brought some new um, elements, I guess you can say, to the program because we get different doctors speaking about different things, and, and yours was different than most others have discussed this year, so I'm glad that you were able to be here. For anybody that's online, first off, let's thank the doctor, right? And for everybody that showed up late, what can I say? You know, our Compass to Care series, which is what this program is, starts at 6.30 p.m., not 7 o'clock, like all of our other programs. So fortunately for all of you, we have video recorded this program, and you will be able to see this after we get it published to our YouTube channel. But meanwhile, if you do have any questions, we would love for you to ask. Um, having anything to do with any of the topics, whether you missed it or um, whether he spoke about it or not, you can still ask again. All right, so I do have some that we had gotten when people were registering, and we do have some that are online. And again, you know, we're just asking you to ask your questions. So the first one is uh, a person is asking, I would like to know how or if you'll be able to do virtual appointments unless, will you be able to still continue virtually appo virtual appointments, even if it's absolutely necessary um, to the person do they have to go in to see people or can they still continue to do them online? For sure. So um, so at least for where I'm presently employed at Mega University of South Carolina, we actually have now a hybrid circumstance, meaning that we actually allow the patient to decide whether they want a virtual or uh, in, or in person. Is now what they call that face to face, what they call that. However, I will tell you that for MS, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do because often you have new symptoms that the doctor or healthcare provider needs to validate and quantitate, and they can only sometimes do that in person. But if a person is doing very well, they have no issue with their medication, it's simply a simple follow-up, it may be an acceptable sort of um, venue to do a virtual, but for MS, it's not the easiest. And so often now, most of my colleagues who do a lot of MS work really want you to come in because sometimes what happens is there's an issue that you didn't notice. The examination identifies things that you didn't notice. So once again, it's, it's an option in most places. Most of the time now, I know that a lot of the, the insurance carriers are paying for it still. So I think for the moment, it's still a viable uh, means of event review and examination. Great. Thank you. Doctor, before I ask you any other questions, do you have a light that you can turn on? It's gotten dark in your room since the sun went oh, down. Oh, oh, sure. One, one second. We certainly can. We can fix that. Great. A few people have actually written to me about this, plus my producer asked me to ask you, and so I'm asking you before I forget. Yes, certainly. Let me hit a button here, young man, and we should resolve this issue in a second. Office. 
There you go. Yeah. Much better. Look at Fair. that, everybody. He's got a very intelligent looking doctor's office there. <laughs> Thank you. I like seeing the people that have all the books behind them, right? I was just but, wondering if you read them all. I have. They're actually it's, not something, it's not something you buy in a store that uh, just looks like books from the outside and it's a whole section and you just stick it in place. Oh, no, no. These, these are actual texts. Yep. Okay, great. Great. Yes. All right. So let me go to the next question. So person is writing um, that they live in a small town and it makes it very difficult to get to, like, the city nearby where they're having appointments. And again, this is, I guess, similar to the virtual one that I just spoke about. And although he, she loves their neurologist, it's difficult to get to. And that's why, again, they, they're, they you know, like asking, what do they do if their neurologist, though, turns around and says that, no, they only want them to start coming into the office. Is there anything that they could say? Well, not, I mean, to be honest with you, uh, Probably not really because what I mean, what, what I'm assuming that he's I'm not quite I don't know this person, but I'm assuming that they're saying the doctor is at least is that he or she feels confident that they can only do an appropriate evaluation face to face uh, is what they're suggesting. And so what I would suggest to the patient is just simply ask the question why. And he or she should be able to illuminate the why. And if the why makes sense to, to them, then you make the, those accommodations. However, I will tell you, there are a number of practices that uh, still do video. The advantage of video is that your doctor can be in Chicago. I mean, right. um, and so therefore, now, the, now when it comes time to the face-to-face, -face, that may require a plane ride. Um, but, but certainly from the point of video, it's doable. So the, the number of doctors are still doing it, and it may be an honor to the patient to find that situation. Okay, thank you. All right, Kay is asking a question, and I'm not going to say last name. So everybody, if you write a question online, you know, it's okay for me to say your name, especially when it's a common name, and Kay is pretty common. Okay, um, okay, Kay. So in the past year, new studies, medications are looking at treating multiple sclerosis as a vascular disease. As patients progress, do more patients develop PAD or other vascular issues? So as a general rule, the answer is probably no. Um, there are a number of crossover circumstances, meaning that it's not uncommon that depending on what study you read, that 10, 15, 20, 25 percent of people that have multiple sclerosis also have another or a different autoimmune disorder. And for a number of the docs out there, they don't think that the vascular disease is actually directly related to the MS. The vascular disease is related to some other autoimmune disorder that the person may have already been diagnosed with or will be at some point diagnosed with. And so, for example, I have patients that have a number of other autoimmune disorders that we see and identify much later um, in their disease course. And the majority of the medications still focus primarily on the nervous system, neuroaxis itself primarily. I don't know that we see much in the way of medications that are on the peripheral vascular aspect of uh, this disease state, even though we do know that when you look at the MS plaque, in the middle of that is a blood vessel. That part's true, and we're still working out the significance of that. Okay, thank you. Mary Lou would like to know, is there any co uh, collaboration between childhood illnesses such as strep throat and multiple sclerosis? Okay, very good question. So the, the actual answer is we don't know. However, I will tell you that if you look at viruses, all of them, take all viruses and put, put them on a the graph, the only one that has a slight, slight peak above the others, just barely above, is mono. All the others are pretty flat. My point being is that to some like myself that believe that there are probably multiple different triggers that occur in life, each individual is different enough, has probably a genetic something that's different in them. The environment that they've grown in is different, unique. 
And that combination is what then triggers what we know as multiple sclerosis. And I think sometimes we don't know what causes MS because we're looking in a single direction and we see something successful and all of a sudden, poof, well, it didn't follow through because I think the causes are multiple. And maybe looking at the virus may not be the way to go. It may be looking at immediate aftermath if we can get to that point. Okay, great. So Cindy has a question. How do you differentiate the difference between invisible symptoms and others? Okay. So generally speaking, what happens there is the patient presents to us and they say, Doc, I'm taking my medications, no side effects. Doc, I feel great. I'm, I'm still running. I'm right, right in my cycle and so forth. Occasionally I have a little fatigue, but in general, I'm doing pretty good. You then perform the MRI per your standard, sometimes once a year, once every 18 months or so, and MRI says, oh, my goodness, you have a new lesion. So that is one way of identifying invisible sort of uh, events, if you will, because the patient was unaware of it. The other is you do the examination of that patient. My goodness, you find such suggestive changes in their eye that they didn't notice that suggest an optic neuritic event happened or a weakness or the loss of a reflex or, the, or a reflex that is too brisk on that one side that wasn't the case on the previous examination. So there's subtleties on the exam, the subtleties that you find uh, right graphically that actually can identify the so-called invisible uh, events. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have a Jennifer asking, is there a possibility that individuals with relapse remitting multiple sclerosis using a DMT may not progress to secondary MS, even if they were diagnosed possibly late with sensory symptoms? and MS lesions? Yes. That's it? Well, it's easy, yes. <laughs> it's hard, because if you saw that previous slide, it showed that, uh, suggested that uh, 56 percent progress depending on the year, but some percentage of it never progress, it's not progressive, medication or not. So in theory, yeah. And, and of course, with the medication that we now have, some of them actually uh, report to reduce brain atrophy as well. And so if you reduce brain atrophy and you also impede the events of new lesions, then yes, ma'am, no question that uh, reducing the tendency to move towards uh, something aggressive or at least nothing else, delaying it onset too much later in life, that also is likely happening. The medication that we presently use and a number of them can actually make that happen. Great. Thank you. Going back to the childhood portion of this, a Jill is asking, can you please discuss the genetic factor in MS? Are children and grandchildren more apt to develop MS? No, they are not. From the, from there the parents. Are, there, the there, there are, uh, yes, sir. There are a number of studies out there. There's some that, I think, in my mind, more than some of the weaker ones um, who suggest that maybe you are. But they, use, they tend to have a small cohort, meaning a small number of patients that they've looked at to make these conclusions. The larger, broader uh, literature out there overall says that in general the answer is no. Um, we don't because as I mentioned during the conference itself in most families there's a single individual that has multiple sclerosis. Rarely do you see multiple members of a family. Now does that happen? Well certainly you see it happen and in that particular group if they were genetically tested they may find some genetic Tr uh, trigger or predisposition in that particular family, but that is more rare than common to say the least. And so as a general rule, it is thought that most family members are safe from this particular disorder. Now, that being said, let's add a little bit more to it. Most MS patients come from families where autoimmune disorders are common. So therefore, even though this patient has MS, the brother might have lupus. First cousin might have sarcoidosis. Another relative may have rheumatoid arthritis. Another relative may have uh, Crest syndrome. And so the point being is that it is common that other autoimmune disorders are in that family, but not necessarily MS as a whole. Right. So when you say, though, about uh, people having 
another autoimmune disease in the family, does that have to be um, having already been diagnosed? For instance, let's back. I'm going to include me on this. All right. So I have a mess. Right. OK. And my father had um, Guillain-Barre. All right. But he was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre just a few years before I was diagnosed with MS. Is it that it's already in both of our DNA that we're predisposed to this coming out somewhere later on in life? So the general thought there in that particular circumstance would be a little different. So as you know, Guillain-Barre is often triggered by either surgery or uh, some, some, some sort of dramatic impact on the immune system that weakens it, often thought to be a virus that occurs of a week to two weeks or so in advance of the event itself. And what's beautiful about this, I'm glad you said this, Stuart. Um, the uniqueness of this situation is that where multiple sclerosis is a disorder that involves the central nervous system, brain and spinal right. cord. Guillain-Barre is a disorder that involves primarily the peripheral nervous system. So where the central nervous system is oligodendrocytes as a source of the myelin in the peripheral nervous system, it is something called termed swan cells, as a matter of fact. And completely different population, different effect. And for most patients with Guillain Barre, there is a substantial recovery and not necessarily much in the way of a reoccurrence. It does happen. And of course there is a Miller Fisher variant of, of Guillain Barre, where they actually have primarily cranial nerves affected and so forth, which can sort of look more MS like, but it tends to be temporary and resolved in most cases as well. So, but to your point, to your question, is there something unique about you and your dad? I mean, it's, it's certainly possible. It's just that the instance of Guillain Barre may be is somewhat seasonal, why MS tends not to be um, to, to a larger degree. Right. Okay, well, I was only asking that because a lot of people are asking, like, the what's the common trigger between these different things happening in a family? I see. And the common trigger for MS is fully not fully known, meaning that we know, well, we think we know, that environmental pressures, for sure, the most genetic, something unique about that patient, we think, there is a potential viral component to this, we think, and then there's then the activation of this event itself. What impact each of these pieces play, we don't know, to be honest with you. Um, and just like when you look at rheumatoid arthritis and these other disorders, those have markers that you can actually use um, and then follow and predict predisposition. MS doesn't seem to have that at this point. Right. So after I brought this up, I got like six different text messages to my phone about the father having Parkinson's, another one having lupus in the family, another this, another that. And it's like, so I was glad I brought it up. It, it, it opened up the eyes of many. All right. So Cindy, a different Cindy from earlier is asking, if you had a patient with JC level of about 3.2, would you continue to give them Tysabri on the monthly basis as it is prescribed to be taken? So if they, they have a JC virus, very high. Usually the term is index. So if they have a JC virus index of 3.2, uh, you would sit down with that patient, explain the risk, risk, um, a benefit aspect of that uh, uh, state, and as a general rule. The answer is you, you don't continue. Most docs are using uh, two different breakpoints. Some are using 0 0.9, anything above 0 0.9 as an index. The, the risk goes up substantially. Some use 1.5 as in the centers on the doc. But in either case, 3.2 is above either of those two. And so most would be extremely nervous and uh, stop you from taking uh, the medicine. Once again, what the medicine is. Now, if you're 3.2 and you're taking one of the medications that typically is not an issue, then it doesn't really matter. So I'm assuming this person is on one of the more dramatic immunosuppressors as a result, the question. Because if you're on, for example, Copaxone, then th that doesn't play a role. Right. So staying with the Tysabri issue, though, at what point do you take a patient or 
Is it patients of yours that are increase their JCV levels are increasing that you may switch them from from every 28 days to every six weeks? So, great question. So, the, the data that that supports the idea that if you move a patient to five weeks or six weeks, it reduces the risk of getting the progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. However, that would not negate the 3.2 to 3.3. All it would mean is that if they are sitting at a less than 0.4, ideally still negative, less than 0.4 value that that person has a reduced risk of development of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So that is done. Patients don't necessarily like it very much because for a number of patients, the week or a few days in advance of their natalizumab or Tysavvy treatment, they are losing energy. They get a, they get a fatigue or tiredness. Once they get their natalizumab or their Tysavvy uh, treatment, they actually get this boost that persists for three and a half to almost four weeks and moving to five weeks to six weeks, they miss out on that boost that they are become accustomed to. You know, I, I, mo I was moved over a year ago to six weeks and I don't, you know, maybe because I just stay so busy all the time, I'm always tired, but I'm tired. I'm not necessarily fatigued, all right? So I don't really notice the difference of the, the, the two weeks additional without I hardly ever notice it. In fact, it's usually I come to that six weeks and I say, wow, that was quick. <laughs> so, so I guess it, it depends on who you're talking to and what they're doing and, how, you know, how they keep busy in life so, and what they notice is actually happening with them. All right, let's move on. Jennifer is asking, if you have sensory symptoms of numbness for three months, does increased intensity of numbness at times mean you have an active lesion or could this be residual effects from the unrepaired lesion. I see. So if the location has not changed, that's key. If the location has not changed and it's basically just waning up and down, that is more often than not, not a new lesion, but you've done something to maybe raise your core temperature or you have uh, done something that sort of is triggering that nerve to be active and so you feel it more. Um, and so that's likely not a new exacerbation, just uh, a rekindling, if you will, of a prior symptom, uh, most, most often associated with um, changing your core temperature. Okay, thank you. All right, next, let's get to a little bit about fatigue. So a person is asking um, or writing first, after 30 years of living with MS, I'm without a job for the first time in my life. After working four hours of, after four hours of work, I'm not working at the same level, making too many mistakes that cost the company too much money and angered the clients. What options do I have? I guess for getting let go. Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, if you look at MS and you time it out 10 or more years and you, that person were to undergo something called neuropsychiatric testing where they check IQ, they check the mental performance, they sort of gauge how you are today versus where you were in the past, about 42% of these individuals will have some kinds of compromise identified by neuropsych testing. And if it ends up where it's dramatic in the area of processing, meaning that you are not able to think things through either quickly or very well, or frank memory is not what it used to be, um, then it does compromise your ability to, to perform in high kind of demand specialties. And so as a result, you would end up on uh, disability more likely than not, because it doesn't reverse. Okay, so going forward, um, what can a person that is working, that is having problems with fatigue on the job, um, what can they best discuss with, um, with their employer about options that they would have doing their job functionally from maybe in a different position? Can you answer that? 
Oh, sure. So, so, so there depends on it if you work in a very diverse uh, environment, meaning that it has those jobs that are very physical, those jobs are more sedentary, then you would opt for the more sedentary if that is part of that job site or that job situation. And that's what you move towards. And often, once you bring the job description to your healthcare provider, he or she then can actually assist you by writing certain things. Patient, just the patient is unable to stand more than 10 minutes without significant fatigue. If the patient is not able to, to do X for more than X amount of time and so forth. And then that, and then you have the job description there with you as well. And then that helps you to combine what the job title sort of equals the new one uh, versus what you're able to do one way or the other. And that's something that can be done as an assistant. The other thing that, uh, since fatigue is a question here as well, keep in mind that studies support the idea that um, exercise tends to reduce. In fact, the studies now that show that people who remain active, like Stuart here, individuals who also have had uh, added exercise regimens to their program, we're talking 15 to 20 minutes a day uh, for maybe two or three days a week. Not, we're not talking about the guy who's trying to get the chest and the arms. No, these are regular folk, regular exercise, which can be simply walking a reasonable distance three times a week, get your heart rate up, that those individuals tend to be ambulatory longer. They tend to have less fatigue as an issue. I want to say this is a tendency. This is not 100%. This is not everybody, but they tend to have redu reduction. That's one way to go to maybe potentially combat this fatigue that you're having. The other way to go would be that uh, patients get these uh, stimulants that have been typically FDA approved for ADHD. Um, uh, and that's your poor visuals, new visuals, and these are stimulus and for some patients uh, quite effective. And for others, they use medicines like amantadine uh, and so forth, antivirus, and, and those have been effective. So once again, there are options that you have uh, before the job description change, and then you, and then you know that you've done everything that's possible to maintain what you were doing. Not it's not working, and so then we make we go for that option of changing actual job duties. Then the doctor can very clearly that we have tried and investigated each and every avenue possible, not doable. This is what we got to do. Okay, thank you. I have to go back to the Tice Sabri. A few people have written in that um, they have greater than 0.99 titer levels. And they don't know what to say to their doctor at this point in time, because they they are just feeling like something's wrong and maybe they should not be you know, kept on Tysabri. Do you have anything? I know that you don't want to speak out against fellow neurologists, but do you have any words of wisdom for them? Okay, so keep in mind that each sort of, there are two sort of break points and philosophies in this, but we happen to use 0.9. So anything above 0.9, we become particularly nervous and contemplate changing their medicine. Even though when when the first number came out, 1.5, that's what we used. Now we use 0.9, um, being a little bit more cautious. But if you're 0.99, that physician could be using 1.5, which is the, the max that most doctors would go with. And so often he or she should have with that the data that tells you what your actual risk is mathematically. And if you find that unacceptable, you should easily be able to tell that healthcare provider that that number from my perspective is too high as a patient, what other option can we pursue? And quite frankly, if that's not working, it doesn't work. Fortunately, in most cases, you have the opportunity to find another or different uh, healthcare provider with a different philosophy on that. Okay, thank you. There's only a couple of questions remaining, but one of them is a little bit, I think it's, they're all important, but um, you know, 2020, we did not have pharmaceutical educational programs to the extent that people once had. So for those pharmaceutical companies that came out with, they had FDA approved medications in early 2020, and people really didn't get to hear about them. Can you please, Give us a quick rundown on those new meds and what they do for the people. I mean, what their intent is. So, so basically, the majority of the new medications, for example, what has now happened is we are categorizing them. For example, the total number, I believe, is around 22, 23. 
However, a number of them are now what we call humor rates, meaning that the original humor rate was Tech for Dara. However, we now have two more humor rates added to that list with the side effect being similar molecule wise and their efficacy data is the same. The primary difference is the side profile seem to be less significant and one of them of course is generic and then the other two are not. Then we have a large group of new ones that are, if you if you like a better word, cousins to Gelinia. They are different versions of that, and the term for that is SP1s. And there are like three to four others tied to that group. And there are four different molecules, and depending on which one you choose dictates sort of the, the, the change. So the Gelinia as a, as a medicine required a person to undergo a six hour observation before it was, during the time it was being started. These others have modifications to that idea and some of them don't require that at all, yet the overall chemical benefit is very similar. And, the, and, and those are the two large groups. Then we have an, an injectable. So you're familiar with the medication termed Ocrevus or Ocalizumab, and it is a CD20 uh, medication term that targets that marker on uh, the B cell. Well, now there is a um, medication that is given once a month as an injection, subacute needle, that is the, one of the newest of the medications, and it is also um, a CD20. Um, and so therefore it allows for you to have that same benefit, but not get it once you're at five months or six months as an infusion, but get it as a subacute injection. Okay, now, because most people, unlike, unlike me, most people listening are not gonna know what, which one you're talking about is the CD20, which is the SP1. So can you give them the names that go with this that came out this year? So I will have to actually look at them because I don't have never memorized the actual names. All right, I can tell you the names. You can tell them which ones they are, right? Oh, okay, sure. Give me the names. Mavinclad. Uh, so so, Mav, so Mavinclad, well, you, you tell me. You're the guy. No, no, no. It's, I'm not the role here. You're the doctor. I'm not getting into that. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just providing, I'm just providing the PowerPoint, all right? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, and, and so, so Mavinclad, now Mavinclad actually is not a 2020 release. It's actually released uh, much sooner than that. Um, okay. it, it, as a matter of fact, because you, because you have on the same time as the release of, of May, um, as, as, as well. And of course, one of them is Clardibine. Right. And, and, and of course, Clardibine is a very different uh, medicine because Clardibine in of itself was a medicine that dates back, my God, um, maybe 10, 15, 20 years as a medication for different uh, chemotherapies. And then it was modified, as a matter of fact, to be used in multiple sclerosis. Its uniqueness is that you use 10 pills year one and then 10 pills year two, and then you're maximized and you're, and you're finished with your therapy. Um, and so therefore kind of cool from that perspective, we're not sure exactly what the long term is going to be with that drug because it is new, but once again, an advantageous from that point of view. Okay, what about Symposia? Uh, Symposia is, as you know, is another recent one as well. Um, and it is more similar to one of the structural medications and, and new and, and recent. And we haven't had an opportunity to use it as of yet. Uh, as well as, um, as a, I mean, as well as, um, what's the other name? Give me the name of the one for the CD20. I don't know. Okay. I was trying to think of it also. Uh, it, it's, it, it's with a K, and I apologize. Okay. If I'm oh, on. I got it. I got it. Casimpta. Uh, Casimpta, exactly. Casimpta yes. is, the, is the injectable sub Q of CD20. Um, and and the Zyposia is, in fact, uh, one of the SP1s uh, that's out there. Thank you for making me look very intelligent tonight, by the way. <laughs> all right. So going forward again. All right. So we have a few questions. All right. So one is a person lives in rural America and they are not near any 
MS neurologist office. What do they have to do to see a neurologist? Because they don't think that a virtual appointment to be seen by somebody brand new is what's needed. So what should they be able to do? What, who can they contact? How do they find what they need? I know the answers, but I want you to answer it. Sure. So uh, one of the advantages of sort of going to the website for the National MS Society is that they actually have a database and a database shows the physicians who specialize in have a dramatic interest in multiple sclerosis as a disorder. And you go on that website, you punch in your actual zip code and it will show you everyone within 25 or so miles of your distance, of your location. And then that's probably the easiest, most reasonable, accurate way to do that. And there's always that person that you may happen to meet who has MS, inquire of them, who do you, who you're seeing? How comfortable are you with him or her as your healthcare provider? And sometimes your healthcare provider isn't necessarily an MD or a DO. Sometimes that person is an, as a, a nurse practitioner or a PA. Some of them are superb at what, what they do. Right. And by the way, the National MS Society, when you put that uh, your zip code in, it's not necessarily the doctor, even that's 25 to 40 miles away from you. It's the closest MS doctor there is to you. Right. So, and that could be 100 plus miles away coming out of rural America. All right. Did you want to continue with anything else with that one? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. Okay. All right. Next. Um, a person is 61, was just recently diagnosed, wants to know what their best options are for disease modifying therapy. Okay. So, 61 is a bit unique. Uh, the range goes up to 60 in most cases. In fact, when I was a, a student, we were taught that no one, no one more than no one 60 or more years of age has MS as as, in terms of, as initial diagnosis. But we of course we find that not to be true. A lot of it depends on what your disability may be, what your symptoms may be, um, as well as a sense of what your images have shown. Whether your lesions are in your brain stem, whether your lesions are in your spinal cord, or they're just located in your head. If they're just in your head, then the doctor would tend to move towards a medication that is. Um, oral likely, injectable likely, but milder. If you have lesions that are also uh, scars in, in your brain stem, which is a part of, back in the low part of your brain, or in a spinal cord, that physician tends to be more aggressive because the risk for disability for you is considered greater because of the location of your scars or your lesions. Therefore, they tend to go with a more aggressive medication. With all that said, guess what? As much as the healthcare provider wants to decide your therapy, as much as you want to decide your, decide your therapy, guess who decides your therapy? Your insurance carrier. And to some degree, they actually dictate because they often will have prerequisites, tiered situations where you, if you have multiple sclerosis, you must take this first tier. If you fail that, then second tier. If you fail that, then third tier. And that is often a common consequence uh, in most settings, unless your doc happens to start you on one of the older, more standard medications, you tend to run into that circumstance. And even there, sometimes you run into the roadblock of cost because we now have a few medications that are, in fact, generic. And so, therefore, that has played a role in, th in terms of the decision making cue. But as a general rule, if your lesion is located brain only, then a milder. Uh, earlier medications often used. If your lesions are in your brain stem or your spinal cord, they tend to use a more aggressive medication. Okay, thank you for that. I have three remaining questions, but before I get to those questions, I just want to let everybody know, please, that um, tomorrow night we're doing a program with our MS Hub series where I will be interviewing Holly Schmidt from the I Conquer MS. She's also with the Accelerated Cure Project. We'll, we will be speaking about things that they are doing right now for research for the MS patients and how people can get involved. Okay, it's, it is very, very important to hear this. And um, I think that everybody that's online and plus everybody else will have a lot to learn from tomorrow's um, interview. Then on Saturday, and here comes somebody that, that Dr. Walker knows very, very well. And that's because I want to put the two of them together to do a program in Central South Carolina, hopefully in 2022. And that is Dr. Mary Hughes. Okay, and Dr. Mary Hughes will be online to speak with our series that's called MS Hughes Now, which is bringing you up to date on what's happening with coronavirus, 
the vaccinations and multiple sclerosis. What's going on with all of that? You know, what you might be, um, questions that you might have that might make you feel more comfortable in hearing her answers. You would definitely want to be online listening to this. And she will also be speaking about things to do with movement. So um, it is a combined program and um, movement is a topic that she loves to talk about, as I'm sure most doctors do. And so we hope that you will join us for that. And if you're not already signed up for it, just go to the MS Views and News website, go to the center column. You're going to see, wow, a plethora of programs that are coming up between the end of this month and and um, and all of next month. It's Everything is listed there. Plus, next week, we have a new series that's beginning on mental wellness. Okay, it's a mental health wellness series, and that's with our guest speaker, one speaker only. Her name is Jessica Thomas. She's from... Uh, North Carolina. She's a licensed clinical social worker, and this is what she is her strong point in in speaking about. So I'm sure you all would want to hear about that as well. Now I have a question that's coming up um, that uh, came up from a couple of people, and I see that others are now asking it too. Very coincidental, but they want to know about the BTK inhibitors and what's coming up with this. There are several companies now that are doing research on this. Who do you think is I can't really say who's going to be the first one out with it because that would be wrong, but um, <laughs> that would be really wrong. But can you tell us about the reason for the BTK and how that far surpasses a lot of what's going on right now with medications? Well, the, the goal there, ladies and gentlemen, is to identify something that has an impact on the progression of the disease state itself, but not be as dramatically immunosuppressive and not give you the risk of the progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And who's going to be first is always questionable. You never really know. I would tell you that because this is a different or different or new approach, the first company to introduce their data to the FDA would have the hardest time because they have to use all this prior data that already exists for other medications to convince them that this is an approach, this is a safe approach, this is a reasonable approach. The subsequent companies will have an easier time. But the main idea, guys, is to identify a treatment protocol that's effective, manageable, but safe long-term and short-term. Because understand that one of the issues you run into with multiple sclerosis is this is not a short-time condition. This is a lifetime condition. So therefore, identifying treatment considerations that go the span of life becomes pretty important. And the last thing I'd like to say to this to you as well is that there are also a data and studies suggesting that potentially when a person reached the latter stages, meaning 70s and so forth, maybe you don't need to be on a disease modifying therapy. That's being worked up and looked at as well. I have patients that have stopped their medication. We've, done, we've looked at them radiographically, looked at them clinically, and, and it seems that their condition has in fact stopped. I have others who attempted that and reactivated. So once again, we don't have all the bells and whistles sort of identified at this point in time. But once again, conceptually for those who've been on medication for a long time, Talk to your physician. If he or she has noticed that you've had no clinical symptoms, you've had report no clinical symptom changes as well. You radiographically have looked the same. They looked at brain atrophy. It looks to be nothing more than a natural progression that everyone gets. Then you may be someone who can consider that as a possibility. All right. Thank you for that. All right. The last question, and it is COVID related. Okay. But it's, um, it's an important question. So I did want to bring it up tonight. And the question is, do you recommend one a one-shot vaccine for someone on Ocrevus due to the effect of that medication on the vaccine's effectiveness if not taken at the appropriate time? Okay. Good question. So there are a number of reports out there where people have been vaccinated, and then when they look subsequently to see if they had a antibody response, measuring antibody, and they see nil, nothing seemingly happened. But that's also some of that similar data in people who are not on immunosuppressive and the same thing sort of happens. So I'm wondering if it's just a technique or is it just um, the consequence in these particular patients of happenstance. But nevertheless, one of the concerns you guys are well aware of, why one tends to wait about 12 weeks after the infusion to get, to get their vaccination or at least four weeks in advance of their infusion uh, for the vaccination while that's done is to hope that you will build an antibody response and then once you actually are treated with the medication in this case ocalizumab or ocrevus 
uh, that you still have that protection. Now, should you do the one shot? Should you do the two shots? Well, most of the data that we have is based on the two shots, right? Because the Pfizer and Moderna are the elders. The single shot, it's been around a while now, but it is a single shot, so we, the data for it is not as robust. We tend to promote the, the double shot at this point in time. I don't know long term what it's going to be the better, but right now in the short term, it seems to be where we have the most data. So I tend to suggest that one, to be honest with you, as a general rule. Okay, thank you. Doctor, I do want to thank you for being here tonight, as always. I can't wait to um, bring our first in-person program to Charleston, South Carolina. And boy, do I know who I'm going to have as a speaker at that program. And But also, as I said to you a few months ago, and I said to Dr. Hughes as well, I do want to get it set up for 2022 at some point when it's a little bit warmer, all right, that we do a program maybe in Columbia, South Carolina, um, and we could have you and we could have Dr. Hughes together and do some kind of roundtable format, and we'll give you, you know, We'll give you the things to talk about and they will fill everybody's desires on what they want to know. And then we'll have a patient or two up there as well to battle it out with the two of you. I don't know. Maybe I'll get up there. We'll see. No, I got to I got to MC it. So no problem. All right. And um, we'll find a few patients to get up there with you as well and be part of that roundtable. And we'll make it so that way every question that people have about multiple sclerosis will be part of that program. Certainly, no problem. Okay. Now, Great. The audience, thank you for watching. Yes, all right. So again, I wanna thank everybody for being here. Please remember to get signed in for tomorrow's program or and or Saturday's program and or next Wednesday's program and or the next 11 that are coming up. Oh, and by the way, Monday night, for anybody that doesn't know already, we have yoga classes that have begun and you can go to our website and get signed up for that as well. And then, um, the beginning of July, we have Pilates coming online as well. We have physical therapy twice a month that are always online. And yes, you could all be part of it. Some of them are Zoom meetings. Some of them are these go-to webinar meetings. And we're just trying to get you all involved with new things that MS Views and News is bringing to the MS community. And again, thank you, Dr. Walker. Have a wonderful evening. I look forward to having you again. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, guys.